Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Liz Real Talk. Happy weekend. I try to find topics that offer some entertainment values on weekend, but I can't always、um, find that. So、um, I apologize if this talk sounds a little bit more、um, more business driven,、uh, but I think it's a very important topic、um, because、um, <laughs> because Mr. Joe Biden said、uh, last week at a fundraiser in Utah that what he what did he say? He said when bad when bad guys are in trouble, they do bad things. And、um, his comment really made a reference to the relations between China's economy and the risk of a war in the Taiwan Strait. So,、um, so that topic, you know, makes me want to make a program to talk to you about the status of the Chinese economy. And as I start looking into it, I, I was、um, fascinated by the information I found related to China's insurance industry. And、um, so tonight, let's talk about. Well, tonight's talk has two parts. First, we'll talk about what has happened in the past two weeks.、Um, Joe Biden signed an executive order banning investment in certain sensitive technologies in China on August the ninth. The next day, he made that comment, and in response, China's Xinhua News Agency furiously criticized Biden, and citing citing the rating agencies. Um, downgrade of the U.S. government's credit rating from AAA to AA plus. Now, both China and the U.S. suffer, or are suffering, economic decline. But the speed at which the decline is taking place is different.、Um, so, I made recently. I made three videos about China's economy. Two of them. The first two are on. Uh, the the chronic what I call the chronic conditions of of China's economic decline, and then the last one is about the、uh, acute attack of a debt、uh, debt problem, and then the ensuing banking crisis. When I made the videos, I wasn't aware how fast things were deteriorating in China. So first, I will talk about a series of events or announcements. In the financial sector,、um, in the past two weeks, or in less than two weeks, in ch- that has taken place in China,、um, and each event alone may not be newsworthy, but when you put all of them together, I think I was shocked to find out how.、Um, I think when you put it, when you put them all together, it shows the status of the ticking time bomb that Joe Biden was referring to, and and then after that, I'll talk about the insurance industry, particularly、um, after so many natural disasters has happened in recent weeks in China. All right, so let me get to the first part. So August second, China's largest asset management company, ZEG.、Um, <clears throat> Here we go. Zhongzhi Enterprise Group is rumored to be in a default situation of more than 230 billion yuan.、Um, it it, ha- it this rumor came about because a, an apology letter signed by a financial advisor working at one of the company's wealth management subsidiaries was widely circulating online. The letter said that ZEG couldn't withstand the pressure of the economic downturn, and one of its products serving net worth individuals defaulted in June, and this directly impacted 150,000 high net high net worth investors, 5,000 corporate clients, and 13,000 financial planners.、Um, the financial the financial planners' job or jobs are on the line. Now the letter also disclosed that the accounting firm KPMG and other third-party auditors are stepping up the work to,、um, in hope of giving the investors and a clearer picture of possible future payments.、Um, and the letter said, perhaps you have to wait three to five years to get your investment back. I think waiting three to five years is still a rosy picture. 
I doubt if the investors will ever get their money back. Um, maybe some of them will, or they will get some back. Because ZEG invests primarily in real estate and the stock market, and neither one is doing well. Now, ZEG is referred to as the China's Blackstone. I guess that tells you the reputation of the company Blackstone. Um, it was involved in Evergrande's acquisition of Wan Ke. The company is not on Xi Jinping's favorite list, um, precisely because it has grown so big and so dominant. Um, before, uh, before Xi Jinping's became the top leader. Um, the group's trust company, Zhongrong Trust, is a known time bomb because of its huge real estate uh, debt holdings. The company has a list of friends. And if I mention the list, it could scare people now. They include, or the list includes, Sunak, Evergrande, Fantasia, China Fortune Land Development, Sunshine City Group, and other then famous and now notorious Chinese real estate developers. Um, Chinese, China's financial media outlet, Cai Xing, said, um, it says, ZEG's liquidity crisis is hanging by a thin thread. So that's what happened on, on August 2nd. And August 6th, official media reported that foreign tourists to China plummeted. Um, Chinese travel agencies received just 52,000 inbound tourists in the first quarter of 2023. And that's a 98.6% decline from the 3.7 million in the first quarter of 2019 before the pandemic. And of the 52,000 foreign, we should say, outside visitors, not necessarily foreign visitors, close to half came from Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau, rather than the US, Japan, Europe, and other parts of the world. And the absence of overseas travelers is very noticeable in major cities, such as Beijing and Shanghai. Um, and those cities saw less than a quarter of the visitors um, returned, meaning that they received uh, less than a quarter of the visitors uh, when compared to 2019 in the same period during the first half of this year. And then on August 8th, imports um, China's customs uh, announced that imports and exports plummeted in July. And and July and July's uh, decline was faster than than anticipated. Import, particularly imports, fell 12.4 percent year over year in July, and even imports from Russia fell at uh, fell for the first time since February 2021. The fall in imports was well above the median forecast of five percent in a Reuters poll of um, 28 leading economists and, and also the 6.8% decline in June. And people attribute this import decline to the weak domestic consumption. I mentioned that in my um, previous videos. I think people, when people talk about China's weak domestic consumption, they often left out one factor. And I want to mention it here. The significant um, the the casualties or the death toll um, caused by COVID um, it is not a public number. It's 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 a secret number. I mean, I've made a number of videos talking about the the possible or the or the you know the the, the possible number of um, death during the three year pandemic. And I think I think the death is a very big number, and that number could have contributed to the drastic decline in China's domestic consumption, because you know everyone is saying it's just because people are not willing to spend the money. Yes, that is one possibility, but there's another possibility: is China has 
you know, many fewer people now than before. So if we do any trend analysis, year over year analysis, or any comparison uh, between now and then before the pandemic, you know, we're, we're not factor in this huge, huge um, percentage of population that has perished um, during the pandemic. So I want to bring that up. And then on August 9th, um, China officially uh, declared that it had deflation. So data released by the National Bureau of Statistics on August 9th showed that China's consumer index CPI fell by 0.3% year over year in July, the first decline in more than two years. And contrary to consumption surge that most developed countries um, ushered in after the end of COVID, Chinese people are reluctant to spend money and business reluctant to invest. Um, wages are going down so fast. And by the way, do you know what profession in China is experiencing a wage increase? Do you know? I found it to be very interesting. Nannies, the salaries, the salaries of, you know, higher nannies, um, the working for the high net worth <clears throat> families, their salaries are going so high, like 7,000, 8,000 a month. Um, and I was wondering why. It's so it, what it tells me is the group of wealthy people or the, <clears throat> the, the uber wealthy people um, have a higher demand of domestic help. And, and then the group, although the unemployment is very high in China, but the um, group of qualified nannies serving these wealthy families is limited. Um, and then there are more people staying at home now. There are more people after the pandemic, they travel less, they stay at home more. So the demand for um, <clears throat> nannies or highly qualified nannies is very high. And then the number of people qualified to do that job is, is limited. So their salaries keep, keep going up. So um, <clears throat> that just tells you something, right? Okay, <clears throat> that's just some side information. August 10th, okay, Evergrande um, admits, finally published its, what, 2022 finan financials, and it reported a net loss of 50, 53 billion yuan, and the company's money funds, meaning cash and cash equivalents, totaled only 9 billion renminbi, which is a, a small fraction of their operating loss of 2022. And so Evergrande Real Estate Group, uh, which is a subsidiary of China Evergrande Group. So this Evergrande Real Estate Group is insolvent with total liabilities of 1.83 trillion yuan against assets of 1.47 trillion yuan. Earlier in the day, what's interesting is Chinese netizens began speculating the next real estate giant to fall. At the time, more than 100 million Chinese read the comments under the hashtag Evergrande's insolvency, or Evergrande is insolvent, or Evergrande is Evergrande's insolvency. Guess what? They immediately found out who the, who the next company is. On the same day, well, we know that another real estate giant, oh, I have, I have logos. I do have logos. Here we go. Country Garden, China's largest private um, property developer, uh, which is also one of the last remaining large real estate giants in China trying to starve off a default. On Thursday, the company filed with Hong Kong Stock Exchange that it its loss during the first half is expected to be $7.8 billion um, or 55 billion yuan. On the same day, Moody's downgraded the company's rating from B1 to CAA1, uh, citing two missed, basically, I think people say it's worse than a junk bond, um, and citing two missed interest payments that were due in August, no, on August the 6th. And the interest amount was 22.5 million, 
Now, if you think about it, twenty-two million dollar interest payment is nothing. It's a very small amount for a company of that size. Um, so it's mind-boggling that <laughs> that China's largest, you know, real estate developer or one of the largest real estate developers missed um, a payment of twenty-two million dollars. And that's a, that just shows you its financial trouble. Now, this company has three thousand unfinished or slash ongoing real estate projects, which is four times the number of projects Evergrande has. And most and different from Evergrande,、um, most of this company's projects are in smaller cities,、um, third to fourth tier cities. And so, if this company goes bankrupt, it would impact many more people than Evergrande, and those in less affluent parts of China will be hard hit. And this will cause, in my mind, bigger social stability issues because people,、um, unlike Evergrande's, who have a lot of large projects in like Guangzhou, Tianjin, or the big cities, and people are more affluent. And people in the third and fourth tier cities you don't have that much money. They probably saved up everything to buy that real estate. And then if this company goes bankrupt, you know it's 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 going to be really hard on you know on those people. So I think if this company goes belly up, it could cause serious social stability issues. All right. And then on Friday, yesterday, August eleventh.、Um, This、uh, country garden stock tumbled by 14.4 percent to a new low in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange to 89 cents. And then also on Friday,、uh, Zhongrong Trust suspend, suspended payments. Here it is, suspended payments of its financial、um, products. This company is a subsidiary of the troubled asset management company ZEG. And this、uh, on Friday, the last Friday, two of its institutional investors, they are Jingbo Gufen, or in English called Jingbo Shares, and Nandu Wuye or Nandu Properties, which are both publicly listed companies in the Shanghai Stock Exchange. They officially announced that payments from from this、uh, ZRT trust companies. Uh, for their matured investment products were overdue, they do not <clears throat> they do not、um, issue payments for the for the for the for the, for the investment products that matured. I think it was on August the eighth. And so, since August, a number of publicly listed companies have disclosed that trust companies are overdue in fund redemption,、um, and the overdue amount is about a hundred million yuan. And Zhong Zhongrong Trust, this company, is at the center of this, and its fortune,、uh, and, and I'm sorry, and its future is highly in question. People say that company is going to go bankrupt because it has so much holdings in real estate. Now, one internet post.、Uh, let me make this bigger. Um. The the one internet post disclosed that a number of other trust companies are in a similar crisis, and the person said a major Lehman Brother moment is approaching China. You know, Lehman Brother was the company that went bankrupt, and it caused the financial crisis of two thousand eight. And three Chinese trust companies were named in that post, and they are here we go. Uh, Everbright Trust,、uh, Mini Trust, Ming Trust, and then Avic Trust.、Um, and and if you look at the ranking, if you look at the post and the ranking, they rank Everbright in rank number four, the Ming Trust rank number three, and then、um, <clears throat> Avic Trust rank number seven. So they're all top. Ten trust companies in China, with asset holdings、um, of nearing seven hundred billion yuan,、uh, 
um, AVIC. I think AVIC is an aviation of, um, is a trust company, I think, affiliated with the aviation industry. And that company has half trillion, half trillion yuan um, asset. So, well, of course, these companies immediately denied it, issuing these statements saying that their companies are running normal and that it was rumor. Now, if I were investors of these companies, I would, if you can, I would start, you know, divesting from these companies or at least do your own investigations. Because this is because China's trust companies can be very different from a Western trust company. So in the West, um, you know, trust company, the investors entrust um, the company to manage the portfolio, right? So you, the trust company is the, is the company that it, the investors entrust, entrusted to run the portfolio for them. But the Chinese trust company is the opposite. It's a project uh, is a is a fi- is an asset management company looking for investors to finance it. Um, so often it will combine elements of the pri- of private equity, asset management, banking sectors in its products. And some people call China's trust a reversed trust company. Um, and there are sixty eight trust companies in China approved. The, the ones we mentioned are all top ten. Um, so. So this, this also set off a storm on Friday. And also on Friday, we heard that China's, um, China's loan pl- loans plunged to 14-year low since 2009 and adding to deflation risk. And also the offshore yuan uh, briefly lost the 7.25 mark um, to the dollar. <clears throat> and on the onshore price, the the uh, the exchange rate also fell from the previous day, so all of that happened on August the 11th, and also on Friday the 11th, China's stock and currency market, I mean the stock market also tumbled. Major A shares, um, major A share indexes fell. Right, the Shanghai index lost 3,200 points, and last week's cumulative decline was three percent. And the last, the largest single week decline in nearly eight months. People attribute this to Joe Biden's comments <laughs> the day before. It's possible because China's stock markets are dominated by individual investors who would listen to what Joe Biden say. Um, and these individual investors uh, uh, contribute to 60% of the trading volumes. And by comparison, in, uh, retail investors only constitute 20, under 20% of the trading volumes. So Wall Street Journal reported at the end of July that China's 200 million strong army of individual investors has turned away from the stock market. And this may be part of the, um, the dip, the, the, the market um, decline. And the journal said that people have lost confidence in the prospect of the stock market and have moved their money to CDs and insurance products. That brings us, that brings the topic of the insurance industry. Um, Now, we've discussed China's real estate bubble. Um, Let me come back. We've talked about China's real estate bubble the banking crisis as a result of its tie to the local government debt, um, specifically LGFVs. We've talked about China's high unemployment rate. We've talked about the low domestic consumptions, but we haven't really talked about China's insurance industry. Now with the typhoon, the earthquake, and also the flooding, and other so many natural and unnatural disasters happening in China, I think we ought to take a look at the financial situations of the insurance industry. Um, Now, the insurance industry collects, let's talk about its business model. I I learned this today. (laughs) It collects premium from, uh, from insurers, right, like us, and then pay the claims when something happens. 
um, but it must invest the premiums in various financial products or in various financial sectors, hoping to generate a good return on the investments to cover the money that it pays out. If it doesn't have a good return on the investment, it will have to rely on getting new customers or increasing premiums um, to cover for the for the losses. So a financial analyst based in Hong Kong did a comparison of, um, uh, did a trend analysis of the past, I don't know how many years, seven years from 2018 to 2023 to show um, China's insurance sector and how it, how it has been doing in terms, in terms of its investment versus its payout to, uh, uh, to the claims. And it has a very interesting finding. And let me share that with you. Um, <clears throat> here, here's the slide. Um, so basically from 28, sorry, not seven years, it's five years, five years from 2018 to 2022 and some 2023. So it showed the insurance fund balance total. This is all of China. Um, so it has it right now. Let me move this away. I can't read the last row of the numbers for some odd reasons. Here we go. So the first column is the total insurance fund balance, how much money it has in its um, as its assets. Um, the next column is the in return on investment, or you could also call investment income that they generate from, from their investments. So, and then if you calculate the investment over the, the investment fund, you get the, the annual rate of return, right? So for example, 2018, the annual return is 4.33%. You just, you divide the seven, um, $711 billion over the $16 trillion and you get 4.33%. That's annual return. And then uh, the, the insurance companies collect, collectively paid out $1.2 trillion. Oh, I'm sorry. It should be yuan. Everything is yuan. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I missed that sign. I should correct it. I'm sorry. Uh, it's not dollars. It should be yuan. Everything should be yuan. All right, okay, mistake on Lee's part, my apologies. Um, so, and also the, the insurance payment shortage should also be in Yuan, okay? I'm sorry, um, this should not have happened. Anyways, so you see there's a, there's a shortage. So, um, so for all the years in the, in, since 2018, the return, of its investment has not been sufficient to cover the insurance payment. Um, so in 2018, it was short by 519 trillion yuan. And the number has go been going down. So before 2022, it was good because they they were the insurance industry was able to reduce the shortage from 519 trillion a, a billion yuan in 2018 to 283 billion in 2021. And, um, and that's, that's because they were able to increase the return, um, the return on investment from 4.33% to 5%. So that was good, right? But then to come 2022, it's a different story. Um, the return on investment was significantly lower. Um, they were not able to generate good return on their investment. And so the insurance payment was short by 1 trillion yuan. And if you look at the first half of 2023, um, they continue to have the same problem. And then the if I, I annualized the 2023 insurance payment um, and then it's expected to pay 1.8 trillion yuan uh, for all of 2023. And it's much higher than the 1.5 trillion in 2022, given the number of natural disasters we've seen. And this is only based on the first half of 2023. We have not factored in the disasters we've seen in, in July this year yet, right? In July and August. So the second half 
um, will be more, and maybe that the payment will be delayed to 2024. So things don't look good, very good, for second half of 2023 or 2024. Um, <clears throat> so, so this is really it just shows you the problem of um, of the insurance industry, and then it doesn't. The problem doesn't stop there. Um, because some people may say, well, well, if you're if they're short by one trillion uh, or one trillion a year, they're they have twenty eight, I mean twenty seven trillion in their in their portfolio. Um, it's it's you know they have sufficient funds to pay it. Well, but they also have, um, I mean, operating expenses to cover. I mean, it's not like the, the money is used exclusively for paying claims. Um, actually, what they have been doing is they have been selling life insurance. It's called incremental whole life insurance. Um, and it's a type of life insurance that functions like an investment portfolio. It's not annuity. Um, it's It's... It's an investment portfolio that you can pass down to your children. Um, annuity pays out every year, but this life insurance doesn't. It's almost like a saving. Like you, you could buy like a three-year term, five-year term, or twenty-year term, and they uh, guarantee a three to three point five percent return um, annually. And it's and because it's so much higher than interest, so it has attracted a lot of people, and so it has been the sole reason for the insurance. Um, industry's growth in 2022. And it has grown so much that China's Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission um, stopped it on July 31st because it has grown so fast and, and, and so big. Um, it's not something the insurance industry can, um, can withstand. Uh, but that creates a problem. I'll show you in the next slide. Okay, at least I got this chart right. Everything here is yuan. <laughs> I feel a little better. At least this chart got the signs correct. Um, this chart, again, I, I took that from, from this um, analyst based in Hong Kong. I mean, he, he has amazing data. And he showed the breakdown between the life insurance and property insurance and their, where their money, where their investments are. Okay, so, and this is in billions of, of yuan. And so if you, first of all, you see the bulk of the money is in life insurance. And it's the property insurance market is very small, right? It's so small. And this is different from the United States. Um, like if you, can, this is um, data from what it's called Insurance Information Institute in the United States, the split between property casualty market and the insure life annuity market is like half and half. And the property casualty insurance is 52%. It's bigger than life and annuity insurance, right? But at least it's like about the same. But in China, it's all life insurance or annuity. The property market is very small. I guess people don't want to buy insurance for the for their property because it's they don't own it because the government own it, right? If you have real estate, you only have what uh, seventy years or yeah seventy years of use. So why why buy insurance to insure it? But life insurance or annuity or or these uh, what you call that um, whole incremental whole life insurance is a different story because that's almost like investment. Um, it has attract, attracted a lot of uh, a lot of money uh, into this sector. Um, but here's a problem. So where has the insurance industry invest their money? The biggest piece I highlighted in red is in bonds. Forty one percent is in bonds, and but where, where, right? Um, or, or I, maybe I should say debt securities. I translate as bonds, but it, maybe that's not a very good um, translation. Maybe I should say debt-based securities. Um, that's loans and bonds. Anyways, but what's, what's that? Now, um, I also want to share this slide. This was from my video talking about China's um, debt crisis, LGFVs. Uh, from, from the same analyst, a third of China's LGFVs 
is in the insurance funds. And that's what that, I think that's what the bulk of this 10, 9 trillion yuan is. So here's the problem. Now, we, we think that the LGFVs are like high risk, right? High risk holdings. So here's the problem. Um, you have 41% of China's insurance um, funds in a highly risk, highly risky LGFV um, funds. What does that tell you? <laughs> I don't feel good. I don't feel good about China's insurance industry at all. Um, given the number of natural and unnatural disasters that's happening in China, and given the amount of the the astronomical amount of money pour into this industry, because people are withdrawing money from from the stock market and put it into insurance. And then the insurance companies are putting the money to buy LGFVs. And that does not give me a very good feeling about China's um, financial future in the near term. So that, that's... Um, that's what I can gather. I think to, to summarize, what I want to say is, if you look at these individual events that I, that I gave you, that I ran down the list in the past 12 days, it may be nothing. It could be just you know a piece of the news. But if you put them all together, they happen so fast, so drastically, uh, within 12 days. I mean, that's calendar days. It's not even business days. And, and, it does not, I think, I think we're so close to a financial meltdown. And that's, I think, what Joe Biden was referring to, the ticking time bomb. And so I hope that this presentation will give you a more realistic picture of this financial meltdown um, from China. And it inevitably has a geopolitical uh, risk factor involved because we do know that, I mean, Joe Biden says when bad folks are in trouble, they tend to do bad things, right? And we know that when the communist regime is in uh, chaos, when it feels like the regime is losing power, it tends to start um, a war to cover up for its lack of control of the country. Uh, because a wartime control mechanism will give them what they need. Okay, so that wraps, wraps up my presentation. And I apologize for the mix-up of the currency signs. And other than that, let me see if people have questions for me. Okay, let me go through the Super Chats question. Okay, wow, I, uh, I'm scrolling down. I think I saw a, a banner a, a, oh, from Elizabeth Loveland. Lay ma most major decisions that she has made have been disasters, three-year lockdown, wolf warrior politics, real estate, red lines, etc. At one point, does the CCP turn on him to save the party? He is the CCP, and he is trying to save the CCP. I think... He, from his perspective, he's doing everything he can to save the, the party. But, but the party is, is insalvageable. Um, and um, I think the question is people, I think I, I like to, I, like, I think you have a very good question, but I like to turn that question around and ask, at one point do Chinese people turn on the CCP to save their country? Right, because Xi Jinping. If you get rid of Xi Jinping and put in another CCP leader, he's going to do the same thing. And because as long as this, the the communist system is in place, the leaders, the only way is they have to get rid of CCP, the party, the communist system. Um, and so my my question is: At what point will Chinese people turn on the CCP to say enough is enough? We want our country back, right? That would be the question that we should ask. But good question. Charles Womack, 
Do you have family in northern China? If so, are they okay? No, I I do not have family in northern China,、um, but I do have friends who have families in northern China.、Um, I I have not heard from them. I have not heard from my fa- friends, so、um, I probably should call them to find out. I hope they're okay.、Um, Alan. Alan Ten, thank you, thank you, Alan. F- travel with love. Oh, this is foreign language. I can't. It's German. I wish you and, and folks good health, success, and happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lay needs more mods. What does that mean, mods? Is that abbrevi mods? Is that abbreviation of some words? There's so many acronyms that I'm not aware of. <laughs> Sorry.、Um, let me see. L. Bad Beigard. Too late. Do you think Beijing will unleash a wave of terror against ethnic minorities once the economy collapses to prevent the fate of the USSR? Uh, ethnic minorities. I think it's gonna wave. It's gonna unleash a wave of terror against all all of the Chinese people, not just ethnic minorities. Um, to prevent the fate of USSR. I mean, right now we've seen the investigation into the healthcare industries, right? I was gonna talk about the crackdown on on hospitals and doctors, and this is major. And then also they're they're cracking down. They arrested the woman who owns the largest immigration company in Shanghai, and that company、um, that company specializes in immigration to the United States. The company has been in business for over I think thirteen, fifteen years, or maybe longer. But the regime uh, requested uh, all client information from that company. I think、uh, the the lady's name is called He Mei, right? And they requested like client portfolio or client data from 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 day one, and so the company is forced to turning all of their customers, and so the person who released the information saying that、uh, the, the, there are customers, there are a lot of Chinese who. Are their customers who are still running between China and the U.S. or other parts of the world? So they advise those people to not return to China because they could be detained if they return. Because, yeah, because the government has has a has a, a list, has the exclusive list of all the high net worth individuals, including government officials, who have immigrated to the United States through this company. Um, and this company is the largest immigration company that specializes U.S. immigration. So,、um, what was I saying? So yes, so not just ethnic minorities, but everyone,、uh, particularly th- those who have money. So why do they focus on the wealthy individuals? It's because Beijing is running out of money. It needs money, so it's focusing on the doctors. The hospitals, and also、um, these these、uh, wealthy people who have、uh, American passport or possibly a Canadian passport. All right, from one three o seven, unlucky.、Uh, would Xi Jinping be accused of being one of the four disasters in human form due to all the crises occurring under his term? A pope was once accused of being a monster in the Bible. Um. Well, it's possible. It's it's possible because he could be held responsible for all the atrocities that his pre- predecessors have committed, that continued under his rule, like the persecutions, the persecutions of the Uyghurs, the persecution of the Falun Gong. Um, organ harvesting started during Jen Zemin's time, but it continued under his under Xi Jinping's rule. And Jen died, so he could be held responsible for all the atrocities、um, that has been com- that's been committed in the past decades.、Um, 
All right. Odds, ODS. Are you familiar with the mandate of heaven? Lawai86 mentioned it in his video today. I heard about it often. Um, uh, I tend to talk about current affair. Uh, so I a couple of people mentioned that to me, but I'll, I'll check it out. Thank you. And um, let me see. Unconventional ideas. Do you think that there are more hidden bombs in the economy that we do not know about? Um, well, I talked about I talked about the insurance companies, which we haven't really talked about before. I think the financial sector is really where the bombs are hidden, right? I mean, the economy, the China's economy is the bomb, but but the first that will be detonated is in the financial sector. Um, that I th I think, yeah, because it affects everyone's. Um, it directly impacts everyone's um, well-being. If you can't access your bank, if you can't take money out of your bank, how are you going to make a living? So, um, and also, money is uh, money does matter to Chinese. So, um, Nick Furry. Do you think Li Qiang would be sacked for the bad, messy economic collapse? No, he he is very smart. You know what game he's playing? Uh, he is called the weakest premier China ever had, but he's doing something smart to protect himself. Like uh, he's mentioning Xi Jinping. Like in his important in the important talks he gave, he always saying, "Oh, we're following the direction of the leader. We're following the direction of." of Xi Jinping. So by saying that, he's sort of, you know, pledging loyalty while protecting himself from uh, saving, you know, saving, you know, cover his rear end, right? So that's that's what he's been doing. So, um, so for now, I don't think he will be sacked. All right, from Michael A. Mayo. Thank you. What what I don't understand is about deriva derivatives. What about? Uh, I'm not sure what that word. Der what about people buying insurance that pays if their insurance doesn't pay? What about people buying insurance that pays if their insurance doesn't pay? You're saying what happens when people buy insurance? And then the insurance company doesn't pay. Well, that has happened. Uh, the Chinese insurance companies offered COVID insurance policies during the first year of the co uh, of the pandemic in 2022. A lot of people bought that, right? Um, it wasn't like it, it didn't. I mean, it was bad in Wuhan and, and in some parts of China, and the government covered up the ins the information so tightly, so people weren't aware of how bad it was. So a lot of people bought the insurance product, and then guess what? Earlier this year, when it was everywhere in China, people want to redeem their insurance benefits. Well, well, the insurance company made it very difficult. Right, well, you have to prove. Uh, that the, your hospital indeed, you know, gave you a COVID diagnosis, and then, then what we've heard is the hospital stopped giving COVID diagnosis. They they were calling it uh, a flu. So, the insurance companies are state owned, and they can change the policy, or they, the government can issue new regulations to change the policy, or make it more difficult for you to make the claim. So that's what that's what they would do, and they have already done that during during the COVID. Um, Ptolemyo Salomon Mencha, Lei, you have a great voice for narration. Do you do any narrations for Audible, or would consider na narrating Audible books in the future if the opportunity looks promising? Do I have a good voice? I don't know if I have a good voice. I feel like I struggle with my voice, <clears throat> particularly during these live stream. Um, uh, sometimes when I when I film, I usually film very late at night. I I was half asleep or 
was tired. So, uh, well, thank you for, for, your, for the encouragement. That gave me a lot of confidence. Um, thank you. I will cherish my voice. <laughs> but reading for Audible, um, I don't know if they want me, but I would love to. Why not? All right. Thank you. Travel with love. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Teacher Lei. Okay. All right. Um, there's a law name, Purgatory Abyssal Helper. Investments toward the ecological sector for natural cures and developments are made. Investments toward the ecological sector for natural cures and developments are made. Um, I'm not quite sure if I get the questions. Send me, ask me, ask me the questions again, or send me an email on that. I'd I'd love to get back to you. Um, uh, I think Lay's sister is a shadow moderator. I don't think so. <laughs> I didn't know that my sister is a shadow moderator. No. Um, <laughs> Okay, so Max Schroeder, is it possible that 50 million died from COVID? If yes, it isn't a big number. Only 3-5% to population. 50 million, I think, is a very small number. I think it's more than that. From what I heard, is it's in the hundreds of millions. It's not in the tens of millions. It's in the hundreds of millions. But the question is... Is it 100 million, 400 million, 200 million? Um, I, that's what I said. It's hard to, because the Chinese government have been covering up on the number of uh, cremations, right? Uh, I think the only way we can find out how many, how many people have died in COVID is we will find out how many people are in China today. And they cannot hide that number. If we don't know that now, we will know that a year from now. If we don't know that a year from now, we will know that five years uh, from now. Because the number of living people in China, that number will prove will prove the how many people died in COVID. Um, so, so just stay tuned. Truth will come out. Um. Rising Flag TV, what's the ac acceptable outcome that Chinese people can do if the PLA becomes desperate, if the economy conti continues to de deteriorate? What's the acceptable outcome that Chinese people can do? If... You mean the outcome? The PLA becomes desperate in what, pre preparing for the war? Um, I think what the Chinese people can do is to defend their rights. You know, I mean, they are, after the floods, there are a couple of protests already breaking out um, in Hebei, where people have lost everything. They have lost their home, their assets, their farmlands, farmland, their families. I mean, they're just asking the government, demanding the government to give them a bigger compensation. And um, and these people are fearless, so I think more and more Chinese will be speaking up because they're being pushed into a corner where they're that they have to defend for their very survival. They've lost everything due to the CCP's bad decisions. So what what else can they do, right? Uh, Van Kat, thank you. Uh, lay Indian defense analysts think PLA will expose their weakness. Hence, will not attack India. Your views? Um, the PLA, I think attacking India is not, I mean, the PLA will not randomly start a war on their own, but they can cause small conflicts here and there to, uh, they could create troubles for Xi Jinping by creating uh, seemingly accidental uh, confrontations with the Indian military right from here and there. And I, I heard that the, the, the last time we saw these confrontations um, between on the border was 
maybe orchestrate it uh, to embarrass Xi Jinping or make it more difficult for him. So I don't think the PLA will formally launch a war. Um, against India because it's not its priority, but you may see, you know, occasional outbreak of situations here and there, uh, and that could be intentional, and that could be designed or carried out by Xi Jinping's political enemies within the PLA um, to make the situation more difficult for him to manage. Karen Patel, how come Chinese people don't see that Xi Jinping is harming to China more than anybody? In such situation, China may lead to disintegrations. Well, Chinese people do see that, uh, but the entire the propaganda, the 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 the, the, gov the CCP has de developed this robust. Uh, instruments to suppress people's voice. They have the guns, right? The police. It has this. It has the world's largest military, the world's largest police force, including the armed police forces, and uh, it has this very robust and elaborate digital surveillance system. And uh, it's watching what everyone says. Its social credit system is monitoring everyone. Um, the it has this super social media apps that's basically a spyware that's watching what you say and do and interact um, online. So all of this, all the, the internet and the digital technologies given the CCP the best tool to monitor its citizens, to prevent people from speaking up, prevent to prevent people from getting organized, so the technology, the internet technology, you know, made the CCP more egregious um, in suppressing people. That's why it's able to do that. It's not that the Chinese people don't are not aware that, um, you know, all these terrible things that their government uh, is doing to them. So, so watch out with all the technological advancement. You know, you think. You know, you think it's a great thing. You know, I think what the technology, you know, as we upgrade our iPhones or smartphones, you know, I mean, the app is trying to do more and more for you under the name. Oh, it's convenient. When you give away your um, fingerprints, your I mean, when you give away control of your life to that device, one day you'll find that you cannot do anything without them. And that's exactly how the CCP you know, is able to control Chinese society and Chinese people. So, so techno if technology is in the control of good people, then they could do good things. But te if technology is in the hands of bad people, they could do terrible things. So, yeah. Jeff Ramos, CCP do not recognize bankruptcy bankruptcy as we know it. How is this company declare itself bankrupt? I love you. Mods means moderator. Okay. Okay. Moderator. Good. All right. I do need more moderators. Okay. I'll think about how to, how to assign, assign some moderators. I have a, a very devoted subscriber, Sumilan. He's always here. Maybe I need to make him a moderator. He's already a moderator. Do, do we, didn't we made him a moderator? I think we already did. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for the distraction. Anyway, yes, you're right. CCP does not recognize bankruptcy. No, it does not. So it can uh, force the company to stay afloat, even though technically the company has already ban you know, is already bankrupt, like Evergrande. Um, so many Chinese banks and real estate companies would have already been bankrupt numerous times um, if they were if they were outside China but they are still there um, because they can decipher they can the government can decipher money from the private sector from wealthy people like you know from individuals and then send the money to these uh, already dysfunctional and bankrupt institutions uh, to make them look like they're still, they still exist. It's just taking the money from private citizens to support these bankrupt um, 
companies. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Let me see. Do I have any questions? Silas Larson. Is the insurance that you say Chinese are buying a guaranteed lifetime income annuity? These pay a fixed amount of money to live off of. No, I'll, the one I mentioned that grew 60% in 2022 um, is not an annuity because annuity you, you get pay, you, you get a payment every year. But this is more like a saving. Um, it, like it, uh, it has a term, like three year, five year, or 20 year term. Um, and you can, you can get the money at the end of that term, but you're guaranteed like three to three and a half percent return. And, and the other benefits is you can pass it on to, um, to your children or to your wife, um, or, or if something happens to you and you can pass it on to your, um, to your wife or to your children. So, yeah, but it doesn't pay out like a annuity does. So it has been tremendously popular in China because people see that as an investment opportunity, right? Because you get 3.5% guaranteed uh, return and then you can pass it on uh, to the next generation but if the insurance company ran out of money then when you need to redeem it the government can you know issue regulations or something to say oh rule rules change now you can pass it on to your children or um, your children have to meet certain uh, qualifications before they can get the money. I mean, they can, it's, it's a communist country. They can do whatever it wants, right? So there's no guarantee because the when there's no rule of law, whatever they say, there's no trust. I mean, the whole concept of trust company is trust. There's no trust. So how... How can its financial industry be legitimate when there's no trust in the system, right? All right. Wow. Okay. Um, I think I've talked for a long time. Brian Cobb lay early this year, stories appear on YouTube about Chinese banks failing and depositors being left with nothing. Is this true? Yes. Uh, the Henan village banks, you know, they have been protesting since last summer. Um, it first, the story first came out last summer, I think June, last May or June when uh, bank customers could not access their accounts. And then the government stepped in. Uh, they allowed the smaller customers with smaller deposit accounts or people who have less money got their money back. But the, the large people with large deposit amounts didn't get their money back. So the wealthier you are, the higher risk you have. So those people um, to this day are still protesting and trying to get their money back. And, and the government have been like harassing them, you know, um, yeah, they're doing all, all sorts of things to prevent them from um, speaking up. So that story is true. All right. Um, Thank you. I'll take one last question, and then, and I guess that's all for tonight. Um, fractal art. Lay's analysis is always very clear and easy to understand. She's gifted at explaining things clearly. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I yes, I was when I was trained as a financial analyst. I realized that good financial analyst use numbers to tell stories. Um, numbers are secondary, right? So if you really understand the numbers so well, then the easier the easier you can explain it, the better. And I the reason I was able to do that it, it was because it was actually because my English was not very good when I first started as a financial analyst. Every quarter I had to go with my manager to present the financials um, against other financial analysts who were native speakers. I was the only <laughs> bilingual analyst and I was so nervous. 
I couldn't, uh, I studied everything. I studied the numbers, memorized everything. I wrote down everything and then forget about them. I think those numbers really lived, <laughs> lived in, my, in my blood. And I have to simplify, simplify them so that I was able to explain uh, the situation or present the financial analysis in the most simplified manner because of my limited English. But it helped me. It helped me tremendously. Um, so sometimes your biggest weakness can turn out to be your strength. Um, if I spoke fluent English, I probably would just take it for granted and just say, oh, yeah, I can talk. I could talk through this. Come on, I could talk about anything. But because my English was very limited, I forced myself to study everything and present it in a most simple manner. And so, so I had the gift. So, yeah, so your, your biggest weakness can become your biggest strength. So everyone has a gift in something. So believe in yourself. All right, enough said. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate that. Uh, I hope this presentation has an entertainment factor in it. I try to find topics that has an entertainment value every Saturday night, but I can't always do that. Uh, but I do thank you for joining me. Um, thank you very much, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.